In this short video, I want to explain ABO blood type. What does it mean to have A-type blood or B-type blood or AB-type blood or O-type blood? I'm sure you've heard those terms and you may even know what blood type you have, but what does it mean at a molecular level to have A or B-type blood? We'll also look at the inheritance of ABO blood type and its importance in terms of immunity and antibodies. I mean, why, for example, if you give in a blood transfusion O-type blood to somebody who has A-type blood, can you save their life? But if you do it the other way around, if you, if you give A-type blood to somebody who has O-type blood, you can kill them. Why is that? Well, in order to answer that question, we really need to understand what antigens are, and in particular, this antigen, the H antigen. Like most antigens, the H antigen is a glycoprotein. Uh, what that means is that it's a protein suspended in the plasma membrane of a cell, in this case, the red blood cell, and then on the back of it, we have a carbohydrate chain. In this case, the carbohydrate chain has four subunits. Um, three of those are the simple sugars, galactose and fucose. And then there's also this amino sugar called N-acetylglucosamine. Now, almost everybody has the H antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. And um, there is a rare exception to that called Bombay syndrome, but, but practically everybody has the H antigen all over the surface of their red blood cells. There's a gene on chromosome 19 that encodes an enzyme that puts it there because practically everybody has that gene on chromosome 19. Everybody has that enzyme and so that antigen is put on the surface of our red blood cells. But some people then have that antigen modified. The H antigen is put there on their red blood cells and then it gets modified by the addition of another galactose to the end of it. And that's what we refer to as the B antigen. So really the B antigen is the H antigen, it's just had a galactose added onto the end of it. Okay? We would say that the H antigen is a precursor to the B antigen. There are other people who, instead of having another galactose added onto the end of that carbo carbohydrate chain, they have another amino sugar called N-acetylgalactosamine added onto the end. And that's what we refer to as the A antigen. Again, just like the B antigen, the A antigen is a modified H antigen, or the H antigen, we would say, is a precursor to the A antigen. It's important, I think, for us to realize, or for you to, to realize that, you know, these are not just geometric shapes that I've drawn, drawn for no reason at all. Um, galactose is a five carbon sugar, not dissimilar to glucose. Um, it's a simple sugar. And even N-acetylgalactosamine is very similar. You can see it's very similar to galactose, uh, but then it has this extra nitrogen containing bit on the end of it which is what makes it into an amino sugar, but very similar molecules in most respects. It's just a slightly different shape because of that. And that's, of course, why I've given it a different geometric shape to represent it. In terms of the inheritance of A-type blood and B-type blood, there's a whole other gene, a gene on chromosome 9. Now remember that, that the gene that encodes the enzyme that builds the H antigen is on chromosome 19. Practically everybody has that. But there's another gene, a completely separate gene, unlinked from that first one, on chromosome 9. And that's the gene that encodes the enzyme that adds things onto the H antigen to turn them into a B antigen or an A antigen. The name of this enzyme is glycosyltransferase. And there are three alleles of the, of the gene that encodes glycosyltransferase. The first of those alleles we call big I A. And big I A encodes a version of that glycosyltransferase enzyme that adds that N-acetylglucosamine, that's this blue molecule, adds that onto the end of the H antigen. A second allele, which we call big IB, creates a slightly different version of glycosyltransferase that adds a galactose onto the end of 
the antigen um, to give us the B antigen. And a third allele, which we call little i, is really a defective version of the gene. Um, what's happened in it, if you've done some stuff on mutations, what's happened is there's a single base deletion which causes a frame shift mutation. And as a result of that, sh that frame shift mutation, it causes a stop codon so that there's an early termination of the polypeptide. It starts to produce the polypeptide, but it's a very shortened one. It certainly isn't an enzyme glycosyl transferase, so it doesn't add anything to the H antigen. And as a result, because it's a defective enzyme, our H, ant our H antigens just stay, anti stay H antigens. They're not converted into B or A antigens. Now, because of course you get one allele from each parent, you get an allele from your mom and an allele from your dad. If you get the big IA allele from both parents, then both of those alleles are perfectly functional alleles. They'll both produce that enzyme which converts the H antigen into the A antigen. Even if only one of your parents gives you the big IA allele, even though you're only going to be producing half as much of the enzyme, remember enzymes are reusable, it only takes one enzyme. So it might happen at half, at half the speed. It might take twice as long for the enzymes to convert all those H antigens into A antigens, but it doesn't really matter. They'll still eventually be converted. And so when you look at the surface of a red blood cell of a person who has A-type blood, they will still have no H antigens. They will only have A antigens because even though there might only be half the number of enzymes converting those H antigens into A antigens, eventually they all end up being converted anyway. So a person who is heterozygous has big I, A, little i, if that's their genotype, their phenotype is still A type blood for that reason. Now it's also important to notice, I think, or to know at this point that because you know, because these molecules um, are fairly common in nature, if you have A-type blood, your immune system will naturally produce anti-B antibodies. Um, and a lot of people don't realize this. Even if you haven't come into contact with B-type blood before, you'll still produce antibodies against B-type blood. And that's just because the molecules that compose that carbohydrate chain are so common in nature that um, you know by about three months of age, most babies will be producing antibodies against B-type blood, even without exposure to B-type blood directly. Similarly, somebody who has B-type blood will produce anti-A antibodies, um, again, naturally without having been exposed to A-type blood. But again, a person who has inherited the big I B allele from both parents will produce, both of those alleles will produce a normal glycosyl transferase enzyme that converts H antigen into B antigen. And a person who's heterozygous, big I B, little i, they will produce only half the amount of that enzyme, but that's all you need. Um, and still all their H antigens will be converted into B antigens. It may just take a little bit longer. Of course, if you inherit a big I A allele from one parent and a big I B allele from the other, you're going to produce both of those enzymes, both of those um, glycosyl transferase enzymes, um, one which converts the H antigens into A antigens and the other that converts the H antigens into B antigens. So half of the, the H antigens on the surface of your red blood cells will be converted into A's and the other half will be converted into B's. And that's what we would refer to as AB type blood. Of course, someone who has AB type blood won't produce any antibodies because if they did, those antibodies would attack their own red blood cells. When the immune system is forming, um, even before you're born, macrophages present samples of all of your um, your tissue types to lymphocytes that are developing. And that teaches your lymphocytes not to produce antibodies against those tissue types. So somebody with AB type blood, that will have happened. Their B cells will have been trained not to react to those antigens. So they won't produce antibodies against either A or B. 
Someone who has O-type blood, on the other hand, uh, neither of their copies of that gene will produce a, a glycosyl transferase enzyme. And so all of their H antigens will just stay H antigens. None of them will be converted into A antigens or B antigens. Um, and that's what we would refer to as O-type blood. I don't know why we don't call it H-type blood. That would make sense to me since their antigens are all H antigens. But for some reason, we call it O-type blood. Of course, because they don't have A or B antigens on the surface of their red, red blood cells, their B cells will produce both anti-A and anti-B antibodies. Um, so that's why, of course, if you take um, some O-type blood and you put it into someone who has A-type blood, that will be fine because O-type blood, it doesn't have anything foreign. It's got H anti, anti, antigens on it, just like like that A-type person has themselves. And as soon as that O-type blood gets into the person who has A-type blood, their glycosyl transferase enzymes will just convert those H antigens into A antigens and that will be perfectly fine. But if you do it on the other way, the other way around, if you take A-type blood and you put it into this person, those anti-A antibodies will stick all over that blood and attack it and that will cause those red blood cells to agglutinate. And in fact, if you have a look at this picture, um, this is a, a test for, uh, for blood type. And you can see that what we have here, this is anti-A antibodies. These are anti-B antibodies. And here are three people. And you can see that we've put the anti-A antibodies um, here and here and here. Um, here it caused no reaction at all. Here it caused the blood to agglutinate, to clump together. Here it didn't. So what that tells us is that this second person, because the anti-A antibody stuck to their red blood cells, that shows us that this person must have the A antigen on the surface of their red blood cells. When it came to the putting anti-B antibodies, mixing that with their blood, you can see that it, it didn't cause any reaction with these first two people, but with this third person, it caused agglutination. So that person must have B-type antigens on their blood cells because the anti-B antibodies stuck to those B antigens. So this person here must have B-type blood. This one has A-type blood. This person here must have O-type blood because neither of the anti -A, neither of the antibodies, neither anti-A nor anti-B stuck onto those blood cells, showing that they don't have the A antigen or the B antigen, so they must have O type blood. If we had a person who had A B type blood, then we'd expect to see agglutination both with the A and the B antibodies.